This chapter is over the peripheral nervous system and reflex activity. Now this is where we are um, in our discussion. We've covered the central nervous system, that was chapter 12, and in this chapter we're going to be focusing on the peripheral nervous system. Now the peripheral nervous system provides a two-way communication to and from the brain. All of the neural structures are outside the brain. So you have your receptors and your receptors are bringing information in through the sensory, which is the afferent division. And then you have your nerves. So you have your peripheral nerves and then you have your motor endings. So you have your incoming afferent pathway and then you have your motor efferent division. Now the motor pathway can be subdivided into your somatic nervous system and the somatic nervous system connects to skeletal muscles, those you control, those are the effectors, the skeletal muscles. And then you have the autonomic nervous system um, where the effectors are things that you don't control like the heart and smooth muscle that's found in the internal organs and blood vessels and uh, the glands of the body. So because you don't control them, there are nerves that do control these, um, these effectors, and those nerves are located in the autonomic nervous system, which is subdivided into the sympathetic division, that's the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic, which is where more housekeeping type um, of activities are uh, controlled, like digestion, diuresis, defecation, um, and these things happen better when you're at rest. This is more of an emergency system. Okay, so the, where we're at is here, peripheral nervous system. So the receptors we said are part of the system because that's where the information is picked up and then relayed through afferent pathways, your sensory incoming pathways. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about receptors. Um, this test is over three chapters, so I don't really put a lot of time into receptors, but I just will go over them briefly. And receptors are defined by um, their stimulus type, and that word is called modality. Okay, that's the type of stimulus that a receptor receives, the size of the receptor field, um, and number of and intensity, um, I'm sorry, number and size of nerves responding and whether these particular receptors adapt or they don't adapt. Now, you can classify them by what their stimulus modality actually is, whether they respond to changes in temperature, um, chemical differences, um, or pressure. Uh, stimulus uh, origin, whether the stimulus is coming from outside the body, things you react to by your uh, special senses, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, and then you have your touch receptors and, and pressure receptors in the skin, um, um, or inside, visceral organs, um, muscle uh, proprioceptors, and uh, Golgi tendon organs, things that respond to changes in position. So those are receptors inside the body. Um, they can be very simple, just like a, a nerve ending, uh, which would be a pain receptor or even a touch receptor. These are very simple, or they can be very complex, which, are, which is what you find in the case of special senses. So you can classify them by stimulus type. Mechanoreceptors respond to touch, pressure, vibration, stretch. Thermoreceptors sensitive to changes in temperature. Um, photoreceptors respond to light energy. Chemoreceptors, they respond to chemicals dissolved in an aqueous solution. So smell and taste are, are ones that are considered chemoreceptors. Nociceptors are interesting because they're pain receptors. And even things like extreme hot and cold pressure, inflammatory chemicals can result in pain and, and um, stimulate that pathway. So you have encapsulated dendritic endings, um, your tactile corpuscles, which are in the upper part of the dermis. Then you have your deep pressure receptors, lamellar or proscenium corpuscles deep in the dermis. Bulbous, uh, bulbous corpuscles, Ruffini endings are found in mucous membranes. Like so, when you're swallowing food, you can feel the you can feel it going through the um, upper part of the esophagus. Muscle spindles are in the muscle cells. They respond to a degree of stretch there in muscles, and tendon organs do the same in tendons. 
And then you have kinesthetic receptors that indicate the joint position and motion. They're in the joints and they send that information to the brain. So adaptation, phasic versus tonic receptors. Phasic adapt quickly. So that, say for instance, you put on clothes, when you first put clothes on, you feel them, but after a while you don't feel them anymore. You're not um, actually always conscious of your glasses uh, sitting on your nose or your earrings in your ears because those, those, those types of receptors quickly phase out. Now tonic receptors, they adapt very slowly or not at all. So pain receptors, usually it's hard to block out pain and also proprioceptors, so you're consciously aware of where you are, your position in spaces at all times. So the perception of pain, actually pain is not a bad thing because it warns the body that there's something going on. So it's a protective action. These are some of the things that stimulate it and the actual chemical messenger that completes the pathway or binds to these nociceptors is called substance P and sometimes glutamate. Um, you can block these pain receptors by some natural types of opiates that are called endorphins and they can block the pain pathway. So there's a lot of people that um, can tolerate more pain than others and um, there's many different um, aspects or different reasons why. It could be lack of substance P, it could be uh, not having enough of those receptors, or it could be having a lot of endorphins, or it could be something mental that they're able to block it out. Um, but pain is actually very subjective and varies from person to person. This is the organization of a nerve, and it should look familiar because it looks a lot like the organization of a muscle. Um, but instead of being um, having endomesium and paramesium, it's endoneurium. So you have each individual um, axon with a myelin sheath that's surrounded by this very thin connective tissue. That's the endoneurium. Then those are bundled together into fascicles and surrounded by a perineurium. And then all your fascicles bundled, to get, bundled together into the nerve and surrounded by a very dense connective tissue uh, coating that's called the epineurium. Now classification of nerves. Now, as far as having pure sensory afferent, so these are incoming, or motor efferent, those are rare. Most of your nerves are mixed. So they have fibers of all these types, somatic afferent, somatic efferent, visceral afferent, visceral efferent, and peripheral nerves are classified into two groups, cranial and spinal nerves. So cranial nerves, you have 12 pairs of nerves associated with the brain, two attached to the forebrain, the rest with the brain stem. Now most are mixed nerves having both motor and sensory function, but there are two pair, pairs that are purely sensory. Actually, we're gonna go with three, okay? Three pairs are purely sensory each numbered one through 12 and name from the nose, rostral to caudal to the tail. And here's a good sentence that if you remember the first letter of each word, it gives you all the first letters of the cranial nerves in order from one to 12. On occasion, our trusted truck acts funny, very good vehicle anyhow. So, I'm gonna give you some nerves to put together and you can save these to a card and note card so that you have them for test purposes but number one olfactory is for smell and that's sensory for smell number two optic nerve is sensory for vision and then skip down to number eight number eight vestibulococcular nerve is primarily sensory for hearing and equilibrium so that's why i say those three fall into purely sensory um, cranial nerves you can lump together three, four, and six. Oculomotor nerve number three, trochlear nerve number four, and abducens nerve number six. Those three together are motor for moving external eye muscles. Now the oculomotor nerve number three also controls the, um, the iris of the eye and the size of the pupil, okay? So three, four, and six eye. And then, the ones that are involved primarily in taste, you have three that are involved in um, innervating the tongue and carrying taste receptions. You have number seven, the facial nerve, 
That one is sensory. It has other function besides sensory, however, but I'm just lumping these together. Um, anterior two-thirds is controlled by the facial nerve number seven. Posterior one-third of the tongue is glossopharyngeal nerve number nine. And then any of, any of the other auxiliary types of taste buds that are found in the buccal cavity or on the epiglottis, those are controlled by the vagus nerve number 10. So when it comes to taste, you have three nerves involved, seven, nine, and 10. So we've gone through this, we talked about this one, this one, number three, number four, trigeminal nerve, number five is a mixed nerve. And by a mixed nerve, that means that you have both sensory and motor function with this nerve. So trigeminal nerve gives feeling to the face. So sensory is for areas of the face and the motor function is for chewing, fibers of mastication. So that's number five. Number six we talked about. Number seven, we said the sensory part of it was to innervate the anterior two thirds of the tongue for taste. And then the other, the motor function, because this is a mixed nerve too, it has both. The motor function is for facial expression. So it's motor for face. Trigeminal is sensory for face. Then we talked about vestibular cochlear. That was sensory for equilibrium and hearing. And then when you go down to number nine, number nine has both because remember it's involved with taste, the posterior uh, one third of the tongue, the taste buds there are innervated by the glossopharyngeal. And the motor aspect of this particular cranial nerve, it innervates parts of the tongue and the pharynx and also provides motor fibers to the parotid salivary gland. Now, number 10 is probably the most complex out of all of these. First of all, we said that it does have some function in picking up taste receptions from the oral cavity, but it's the only cranial nerve that extends beyond the head and neck region. And the, it, it actually controls a large percentage of the parasympathetic output, output that's involved with that system, 75 to 90% actually, varies from textbook author to textbook author, but it innervates the heart, the lungs, the visceral organs, so it is a nerve that affects quite a bit of autonomic functioning as well as having some connection to taste. When you go to number 11, the accessory nerve, that's primarily a motor nerve. So it innervates muscles involved in swallowing as well as the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles which move the head and neck. Number 12, hypoglossal, innervates the um, extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue, so it contributes to speech and swallowing too. That one's primarily motor. So there you have it. Now, if you remember this little sentence, and we're looking at whether these nerves function in sensory function, motor function, or both sensory and motor, this sentence, the first letter of the words, most of them begin with S, M, or B for sensory, motor, or both. So if you remember, some say marry money, but my brother says it's bad business to marry money. That gives you the function of the 12 cranial nerves in order. Now we're gonna take a look at spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of mixed nerves. They're named for the point of issue from the spinal cord and they supply all body parts but the head and part of the neck because that is going to be the function of the cranial nerves. So you see here, they're broken into groups. You have eight cervical nerves, C1 through C8, 12 thoracic, T1 through T12, five lumbar, L1 through L5, five sacral, S1 through S5, one coccygeal, C0, not to be confused with C1. And there is a breakdown of the spinal nerves. Here's all your different groups here. And you will see, we're gonna find that these nerves are actually grouped into plexuses. So you have what's called a cervical plexus, a brachial plexus, a lumbar plexus, and a sacral plexus. And we're gonna talk about the important aspects of these four different plexuses. So, the cervical plexus um, is involved with 
cervical nerves C1 through C5. Now you see that there's a lot of branching and crossing over that occurs with between the nerves in a plexus. So because of this, disabling or injuring one nerve doesn't totally inactivate the whole plexus because you do have crossing over of fibers. The most important nerve, um, the one I'm going to speak to in this particular discussion is the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm. So it's one of the most important nerves with respiratory function. And irritation of the phrenic nerve causes um, spasms of the diaphragm, which could result in hiccups. Just an interesting fact. Now the brachial prep plexus is important for innervating the arm. So you have five nerves here that are important in this plexus. So the axillary nerve innervates the deltoid and teres minor. Then you have the musculocutaneous nerve that's involved with innervating the bicep brachii and brachialis muscle. The median nerve is involved with flexor muscles of the arm. Ulnar is involved with flexor carpi ulnaris and part of the flexor digitorum profundus. And then your radial nerve innervates um, all of the extensor muscles. So you don't have to memorize every single one and what they do. I just want you to recognize them. If you saw a multiple choice question to be able to determine which of these is not part of this plexus. Um, if you're going into PTA or OTA and you're going to be, or even radiology, I would um, recommend that you have a general idea of functions because it'll help you moving into your program. Um, there's your functions of all your nerves. And then we get into the lumbar plexus. Now the lumbar plexus is involved with um, innervation of the thigh, the abdominal wall, and the psoas muscle, and the major nerves of the femoral and the obturator muscle. So when you're thinking about the quadricep group, the largest group of muscles that you have in the anterior surface of the leg, the femoral nerve is what innervates that. And when, they're do when you're doing the knee jerk reflex, they're testing that connection, the femoral nerve to the quadricep group. The sacral plexus, um, this one serves the buttock region, lower limb, pelvic structures, and perineum. And the, the uh, largest, thickest nerve of the body is located in this plexus. This nerve is um, the sciatic nerve and it's composed of two nerves actually coming together. The common fibular nerve and the tibial nerve together make up the sciatic nerve. Now dermatomes um, represent an area of skin that's innervated by a branch of a single spinal nerve. All spinal nerves except for C1 participate in dermatomes. So you can get an idea if you have pain in a certain area of the skin, what particular spinal or cranial ner or spinal nerve it's originating from. These are all spinal. Now a reflex arc, um, when you talk about a reflex, it's a quick, involuntary stereotyped reaction of glands or muscles to stimulation. Um, they, some of them are inborn, they're intrinsic, they're innate, and some of those you acquire, they're learned. Um, it may involve only peripheral nerves and spinal cord, but they could be something that's built into higher brain functioning as well. So some of these reflex actions could be cerebral. There are five components of a reflex arc. First of all, you have a receptor. That's the site of the stimulation action. Then you have a sensory neuron. That's your afferent pathway that transmits the impulses to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is where integration occurs, and it's either one neuron, that means monosynaptic, or polysynaptic region within the central nervous system. It could be two or three neurons involved in the chain. The motor neuron conducts efferent impulses from the integration center to the effector organ. And the effector is the muscle fiber or the gland cell that responds to the efferent impulses by contracting or secreting. That will be the effect that's carried out. 
So there, there it is in picture form. There's your receptor. So somebody sticks a nail in your skin. That impulse goes by way of the sensory neuron. That's afferent to the integration center here in the central nervous system. This is the gray matter of the spinal cord. There's where your interneuron is. And then motor, motor neuron efferent going out to an effector. And in this case, it's probably going to be a withdrawal reflex wherever that nail is to contract that muscle and pull that limb away. Now, muscle spindles are non-contractile um, types of muscle fibers that are embedded within muscles. So they're stretch receptors. And your contractile regions are innervated by gamma efferent fibers, and they maintain the spindle sensitivity. Now, your extrafusal, these are the ones that are outside the muscle spindles. They're innervated by alpha or efferent fibers. So there are different types of fibers involved, and the muscle spindles themselves are non-contractile, but they respond to the degree of stretch. So what happens is if you're doing a knee-jerk reflex and you take a, a patellar hammer and you tap the patellar ligament, that causes the quadricep to be stretched. You don't really sense it, but those muscle spindles do. And when they're stretched, their response is to contract. So you kick out your lower leg, and that's the reflex. So when these are stretched, they contract, cause the muscle to contract, which kicks out the lower leg. So that's your reflex, and it's caused by these um, spindle fibers embedded within the skeletal muscle. So it's showing you here what's happening during this whole reflex action. Tapping the patellar ligament stretches the quadricep and excites its muscle spindles. Afferent impulses travel to the spinal cord where synapses occur with motor neurons and interneurons. The motor neurons are in red, send the activating impulses to the quadricep, causing it to contract, extending the knee. And interneurons in green here, they actually inhibit synapses with the ventral horn neurons that prevent the antagonistic muscles, which are in the hamstrings, from resisting the contraction of the, of the quadriceps. So you're contracting the quads, inhibiting the hamstrings. Now the tendon reflex works opposite of what would be found with the um, knee-jerk reflex or working opposite of those spindles that we talked about. What happens is contracting the muscle activates the Golgi tendon organs. And then these Golgi tendon organs are stimulated and those neurons inhibit that contracting muscle and you activate the antagonist muscle. So in other words, contraction causes a stimulation of the antagonist and relaxation of the contracted muscle. And the idea is to prevent muscle injury. So here is how it works. Quadricep is strongly contracted. You see that. Afferent fiber synapse with interneurons in the spinal cord. So there's your stimulus going to the central nervous system. Then your outgoing efferent impulses to the antagonistic muscle group. Here are the hamstrings. And so the efferent impulses to muscle with stretch tendon are damped. Muscle relax, relaxes, reducing the tension. So that's the idea there.